Welcome to the Untold Tales Audio Anthologies. Written by Dr. Jeffrey A. Robinson and narrated by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. The Gift of Memory A man with a clipboard stood with a group of others in white hospital coats and gazed across the courtyard of the convalescent hospital. Several of the facility's residents sat in wheelchairs, which were parked in the warm morning sun. A tall, distinguished-looking man in his mid-thirties, with dark hair and wire-rimmed glasses, approached one of the patients and spoke. Margaret, do you remember me? The woman looked up and turned toward the man, with a look of curiosity. No, she said. I don't think so, young man. Have we met? My name is Eric Morrison. I'm a doctor. I just wanted to know how you're doing today. Oh, I'm fine, she said, waving dismissively at him. I'm just waiting for my husband, Walter. He's coming by today to take me for a drive. We always go for a ride on Sunday afternoons. She turned her head and looked out at the long driveway across the hospital's wide lawn and searched in the distance for any sign of Walter's car. Margaret, the man asked again, do you have trouble remembering things? Oh, not at all, she said. I just get tired more often now. Why is that? Dr. Morrison asked. <laughs> because I'm an old woman. I'm 70 years old and I've a right to be tired, she smiled sweetly. I see, the doctor said. Well, thank you for talking to me, Margaret. You're welcome, she said. Come back any time. She turned her attention once more to the distance drive and started humming to herself softly as she waited for Walter. The man walked back across the courtyard and rejoined the others, Dr. Morrison raised his clipboard, adjusting his glasses, and began to read his notes aloud. Margaret Winters, age 84, was admitted to Farhaven Convalescent Hospital 15 years ago when she began to suffer from severe memory loss. Her husband, Walter, died of a heart attack two years later. Margaret has been here ever since. One of the younger members of the group said, But she said she was waiting for her husband. Dr. Morrison looked up from his notes and said, Yes, she doesn't remember that he died. She still thinks he's coming to pick her up. That seems to be one of the few things she remembers clearly anymore. We've been examining Margaret for over a month and talked to her every day. Unfortunately, regardless of how often we introduce ourselves, she still doesn't remember us or recognize us. She is suffering from acute memory disorder called anterograde amnesia, a memory disorder similar in ways to advanced Alzheimer's disease. Basically, Mrs. Winters has lost the ability to acquire new memories. She forgets events and conversations seconds after they occur. Her world now revolves around a single memory, which sustains and satisfies her. Her case is severe, but is still mild compared to many others who've forgotten who they are or even how to speak. Dr. Morrison lowered his clipboard and folded his hands in front of him. Margaret Winters will be one of the first patients in a clinical test of a drug to treat memory dysfunction. Is that ethical? asked one of the interns. How can she consent to treatment if she isn't qualified to understand or remember what's going on? She's not competent to make such a decision. Dr. Morrison replied, Good question. We received permission last week from Mrs. Winters' daughter in Florida. At first, the daughter declined our request for Margaret to participate in these trials, but she changed her mind suddenly and now has great interest in these clinical tests. Apparently, the daughter is 60 years old and was diagnosed a few weeks ago with early onset of the same degenerative memory condition that her mother has. She's already beginning to manifest memory loss of her own. It seems the genetic susceptibility for this disorder is inheritable. In any case, the daughter has now given her permission. Tomorrow, we begin administering the new drug, Nemerol. The next morning, Dr. Morrison addressed an assembly of the nursing home staff. 
Mrs. Winters, who most of you know as a longtime resident of Fairhaven, will be participating in a new clinical study for a new drug to specifically treat memory disorders. Three other patients at this facility will also be involved in these tests. Our company, which manufactures the medicine, will provide one full-time observer here at the facility. However, we want the rest of the staff to be aware of these tests so they can be alert for any signs of abnormalities in our patients. The tests here are part of a larger study that will involve over a thousand other subjects at dozens of facilities across the country. The drug we're evaluating is experimental, and while there were no side effects in the primate studies last year, the human brain is far more complex, and there's a lot more to go wrong. Exactly what is the drug? asked one of the staff members. It's called Nemerol, he said and it reverses the effects of a naturally occurring neurotransmitter in the human brain called lethazine. From initial studies, we've learned that lethazine only seems to have one primary function. It disables neural connections. If there's too much of this chemical, too many brain cells are turned off, and huge tracts of the brain are rendered inoperative over time. It took a great deal of research to identify lethazine as one of the primary causes of some of the most severe memory disorders. It took 15 more years to design a neuroactive peptide to counter its effects. We've known for a long time that up to 90% of the human brain isn't actively used. In younger people, the unused portions act as a reservoir set aside for lifelong learning. In adult brains, however, lethazine buildup ties off an increasing number of brain cells, and eventually most of the brain gets locked away, out of reach. In some individuals, the body generates so much of this chemical that they lose the ability to access old memories or regain new ones. While there are many memory disorders, the worst ones end up like this, where the subjects with active minds have virtually no access to their own memories. Another member of the staff asked, Does this mean that you have a cure for Alzheimer's and dementia? Oh no, I didn't mean to imply that. Dementia has many different causes and Alzheimer's is a different type of brain tissue degeneration. No, this treatment, if successful, will only help about 10% of people with severe or incapacitating memory loss. Though some people may have been misdiagnosed as having Alzheimer's, we won't be able to help those that really do have that malady. He paused, waiting for more questions, but no one spoke up, so he continued. Clinical studies on primates last year revealed no adverse side effects to the new medication. Moreover, initial results were incredible. Lost memories were fully restored with initial administration of Nemerol. Incrementally higher doses further enhanced memory, resulting in near-total recall. After these trials, new longitudinal studies are planned to study possible relationships between enhanced memory and intelligence, but those are years away. In our tests here, we're hoping to demonstrate the effectiveness of Nemerol as a remedy that can reverse many types of memory dysfunction. Because of the success of the primate research, the FDA has approved Nemerol on its new fast-track release cycle. With luck, it could be available commercially by the end of the year. Dr. Morrison sat across from Margaret Winters. Their interview together had become part of Margaret's daily routine. Are you feeling better today, Margaret? he asked. Oh, yes. You have no idea how good I feel. I can't tell you how grateful I am for all you've done. He smiled and continued. What's been the most significant change you've noticed since you started your new medication? What's the biggest change? Margaret echoed. Why, you've given me back my life. The old woman's eyes filled with tears. Are you all right, Mrs. Winters? Is anything wrong? Oh, no said Margaret, smiling sweetly. Nothing's wrong. It's just that I now remember all the times you visited me before. I'm so sorry. I simply didn't know. It's just so sad how I wasted nearly 15 years just sitting here waiting for Walter to return. I I never understood that 
he was never coming back. You remember Walter now, he asked. The look of sadness and pain on Margaret's face tore at his attempt to remain professionally detached. Oh, land's sake, yes. Those are the memories I cherish the most. You see, my husband died when my memory had completely failed. He was a good man and constantly labored to take care of me. I'd all but forgotten him, but now I remember him again. She closed her eyes and smiled. Now I can see him clearer than any photograph. Tears rolled down her face, and she gently wept. Dr. Morrison asked, But if these are happy memories, why are you so sad? Margaret looked at the doctor closely and studied him for a moment. Then she gently reached out and patted his hand. Because I've only recently found that Walter died, and I've never actually grieved for him. Mourning is just something I have to do. It's all right, she said, taking another tissue from the box in her lap. Don't worry. You've given me a gift I can never thank you enough for. I just have a lot of catching up to do. The doctor terminated the interview and rose to leave. As he looked back, Margaret sat quietly in her wheelchair, wiping away tears of joy and sorrow. Dr. Morrison sat at his desk, reviewing research reports from Dr. David Blake, the co-sponsor of the research project. Blake summarized the clinical statistics he had recently compiled. After four months, the primary phase of testing is complete. More than 1,000 patients participated in the trials and achieved more than a 95% recovery rate. Ironically, the ones who didn't respond appear to have been misdiagnosed and suffer from other non-pneumonic neurological problems like Alzheimer's or Lewy body dementia. Nevertheless, we've demonstrated an effective cure for about 20% of those suffering from degenerative memory disorders. As a result, the board of directors of our parent company has authorized a full publicity blitz. While we haven't completed the toxicity test to gauge effects of overdoses, the FDA is ready to give us a tentative approval for formal market release. When we get the word, we can have Nemerol at pharmacies across the country within a week. This is going to be the biggest thing to hit the streets since Viagra. Actually bigger, since memory disorders are more common than erectile dysfunction. Blake grinned greedily. Oh, he added. The board's also authorized your recommendation to investigate the use of smaller doses of Nemerol as memory enhancement pills for people with normal brain function. They're still debating whether or not it'll be financially viable to target studies related to attention deficit disorders. Since there are fewer people afflicted with ADHD, the return on investment wouldn't be as great. Eric Morrison tapped his computer monitor. What's this email telling me? To set aside time for meetings with marketing? Oh, said Blake. They want you to be part of their advanced sales publicity campaign. You mean commercials? Morrison asked. No, I think they mean lectures and tours. You'll have to talk to them. Morrison shook his head and opened up his desktop calendar. This is going to cut into my research again, he thought angrily. I've still got to finish those reports for this fall's referee journals. He muttered to himself and started canceling appointments to accommodate marketing's meeting schedule. Eric Morrison fidgeted with his collar. He felt more comfortable in a lab coat than in a suit and tie. He glanced to his left and saw Margaret Winters sitting calmly, deep in thought. To his right was the talk show host, who was listening intently to something being said over his earpiece. The studio cameraman signaled silently, and the talk show host picked up the cue. Welcome back to Explorations in Science, he said, the weekly talk show that focuses on science and technology. <laughs> 
Just before our commercial break, we were talking to Dr. Eric Morrison, the developer of the new drug Nemerol, which has received such high acclaim in recent weeks as the new miracle cure for Alzheimer's. We also have Margaret Winters, one of the first patients to test this new medication. Now, Margaret, you were telling us how it changed your life. Margaret smiled politely and nodded. It's just like Dr. Morrison described it, she said. When I first developed symptoms of memory loss, I hardly noticed. It's funny, but you never know what you've forgotten. You don't realize how much you're losing. As I got worse, my memories just shrank and shrank until I was hardly aware of anything anymore. Eventually, I spent 15 years staring out a window at a nursing home with no understanding of the passing of time. I wasn't aware that my husband had died or that I'd become a great-grandmother. My family visited me for a while, but eventually they stopped coming. Talking to me was about as much fun as talking to a chair. I simply wasn't there. And now? the host prompted. Now I'm back, she said confidently. I can function normally again. I'm reading a lot. My lord, do I have a lot to catch up on. <laughs> so much has happened since I went away. She laughed openly. Her genuine delight shone brightly in her eyes. So your memory is better then, the host asked. Oh my, yes, she replied blushing. I hear you can do some remarkable tricks with your memory, the host asked. Is this true? <laughs> well, yes, I, I guess so. My memory's gotten quite good. Can you show us something? Sure, what would you like to see? Well, the host said, I've heard you can recite anything you've read. Margaret blushed again. <laughs> yes, that's true. I remember most anything I've read recently. Can you give us an example of something you've read? Sure, she said. Margaret started reciting the opening sentences of a mystery novel she'd read last week. Her gaze grew distant, and she reeled off the first paragraphs effortlessly. Mrs. Winters? Mrs. Winters, the host said, trying to interrupt her. Margaret continued reciting the books. First chapter. Dr. Morrison cut in and stopped the host. Excuse me, you'll have to give her a moment. She's dropped into a state that's called flow. Normally, it's a semi-meditative state of intense concentration, but Margaret is manifesting a fugue state we've termed hyperlucidity. It's a side effect of her enhanced memory. She can continue to recite the book for as long as it took her to read it. Longer, really since she's learning to speed read. Why is she staring like that? The host asked. Because she's actually reading written words, Morrison replied. She's mentally retrieving images of the pages she saw and is reading them out loud. How long will she be like that? Asked the host, leaning back in his chair. It could be a few seconds or several hours, depending on how much she wants to impress you or until something interrupts her. How do you interrupt her? The host asked. By touching her or interrupting her field of vision, he replied. Dr. Morrison waved his hand in front of Margaret's face. She stopped talking and blinked several times. Putting her hand to her mouth, she said, Oh my, I did it again, didn't I? <laughs> yes, answered the doctor, but it's okay. You did spectacularly. The host shook his head in amazement. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Can you do that with all of your memories? Oh, no, said Margaret. New memories are very clear, but older ones come a bit harder. Sometimes it's like sorting through an old trunk of misplaced photographs and letters. I have to rummage around and search for memories that I've lost. <laughs> Some are very hard to find. Once I found a specific memory, however, it's always there, once more, just as clear as the day it occurred. Dr. Morrison interjected, 
The drug in her system can repair neural pathways that have been disabled over time, but only if those pathways are activated. She has to find a memory in order to have access and have it repaired. The process of regaining old memories is slow and incremental. It's still ongoing. Can everyone take advantage of this marvelous new treatment? asked the host. No, said Dr. Morrison. Nemerol is only available right now to those diagnosed with specific types of memory dysfunction. However, an over-the-counter version is planned for next spring for people who aren't afflicted. We expect comparable memory improvements in normal people. It will be marketed as a memory pill. The new version will probably be quite popular with struggling college students. Well, we can't wait, said the host. Facing the camera, he continued. We'll return to talk to Dr. Morrison more about this remarkable new drug after this brief word from our sponsors. Margaret's life at the nursing home had been transformed. She received visits from her family and enjoyed the company of great-grandchildren she'd never met. She cried uncontrollable tears of joy and cherished her new experiences. Life to her now was wondrous. It was like returning from the dead. Moreover, all she had to do was close her eyes, and she could re-experience those joys whenever she wanted. Since she no longer needed the extensive care she'd required before, she decided to volunteer assisting other residents in the nursing home. She dedicated herself to helping others who weren't as lucky as she. Most of the other patients had other medical problems for which there was no miracle cure. Margaret soon became a favorite of the staff. She was so cheerful, patient, and kind to the other residents that the staff sought her out to help them. Today, she was working with a woman with cerebral palsy. As she leaned over to assist the woman and help her from her wheelchair, the handicapped woman struck out and hit Margaret hard on the mouth with one of her flailing arms. Margaret staggered back and almost fell, but she caught herself. Margaret raised her hand to her lip and saw blood on her fingers. Turning to the woman she'd been trying to help, she realized that the other woman wasn't even aware that she struck Margaret. It's so sad, Margaret thought. Then, in an unexpected flash of memory, Margaret remembered striking another nurse the same way several years before, back when she couldn't take care of herself. Margaret looked around and noticed that the nurse didn't even work there anymore. She couldn't even apologize. Margaret suddenly felt ashamed. Before she could recover, she suddenly experienced another involuntary memory. She vividly remembered a similar incident with her husband just before he'd died. She'd struck him, too, and given him a black eye. At the time, she didn't know she'd hurt him and hadn't even recognized him when she had hit him. Margaret started to cry. She then recalled a third situation long ago. Once, when her daughter was a child, she'd slapped her in anger. She'd struck too hard and made the child's lip bleed and swell up. At the time, Margaret had been overwhelmed with shame and remorse, but she'd long since forgotten about it. Now, the unwanted memory returned, and she once again experienced the intense regret of that accidental blow. The memory was vividly clear, and the anguish cut her like a knife. Unaware of others around her, Margaret collapsed into a nearby chair and continued to cry. Dr. Blake knocked on Dr. Morrison's door. Eric, he said, we're receiving reports about side effects emerging in our first Nemerol test subjects. What? said Morrison, looking up from the paper he was writing. After 22 months? Yes, said Blake, approaching the desk and handing Morrison the hard copy of the latest summaries. It appears that as time goes on, older and older memories are emerging in the test patients. These are memories that were very deeply buried, memories that haven't been accessed for years. The memories appear to be broken chains that have long since been isolated from the active neural network. In the process of repairing disabled neurons in the brain, Nemerol eventually reaches these broken chains 
and retrieves memories that were abandoned long ago. Here's an example. Do you remember Margaret Winters? She was one of our first test subjects. Eric Morrison nodded. Yes. I went on that lecture series with her, right? That's correct. Well, apparently there was an incident at the nursing home last week that triggered a particularly sad memory. It somehow produced a cascade effect. In rapid succession, she recalled dozens of other painful memories and their sudden near eidetic clarity overwhelmed her. She started to cry and couldn't stop. Each painful memory reminded her of another. She was inundated under a flood of unwanted and forgotten memories she couldn't deal with. We're only speculating, but imagine what it would be like if you suddenly recalled every time you were hurt, embarrassed, ashamed, or afraid. What if you remembered every slight anyone ever committed against you? Everyone accumulates memories like these over time, but apparently we learn to forget them so they don't continue to bother us. It's made some of our other researchers wonder whether forgetting painful episodes might be a normal and healthy part of mental health. Margaret succumbed to this onslaught of unwanted memories and sank into a deep, intractable depression. That's terrible, muttered Morrison. Have they done anything to help her? Blake pointed at the report. They started a standard regime of antidepressant drugs. It appears to have stabilized her. She can talk and function again, but everyone says she's changed. She's sad most of the time, and isn't as outgoing as often as she had been before. Morrison thought quietly for a moment and then said, Send an alert to the other study teams to watch for similar effects and recommend that they be ready to reduce the dosage for those who develop these symptoms and have them stand by with antidepressants should similar cases appear. Have one of the grad students compile data on the percentage of subjects that manifest this side effect and report any trends to me immediately. Pausing, he asked, has this appeared in any patients other than those originally suffering from memory dysfunction? No. There have been no reported incidents in any normal subjects, though most people taking the memory enhancement pills are quite young, and those with severe memory loss were much older. It may be related to brain damage from their long-term dysfunction. Let me know if the assessment changes, he instructed. I will, Eric, Blake replied, and he dashed out of the office door. Margaret was spending more and more of each day with the research team at the nursing home. They were paying her a stipend now for the time she spent working with them. The doctors gave her a lot of tests and a lot of things to read. She had to recite back everything and participate in lengthy interviews that left her exhausted. Her problem was that, lately, she was getting confused. Despite her near-perfect recall, it was as if she had several different versions of the same memories. They were all similar, but the details differed slightly in each. She'd never noticed this before, but as she spent more time exercising old memories, she found that there were more and more images of events that surely only happened once. This disturbed the doctors on the research team. They spoke about false memory syndrome and increased the number of tests they administered. Margaret didn't tell them about her continuing depression, or about the nightmares that she'd started to have. She knew they'd simply increase her dosage of antidepressants, and she hated those medications. They made it difficult to think at all, and hardly diminished the overly vivid memories at all. When they raised her dosage, she wandered around like a drunkard. It was particularly uncomfortable when the drugs wore off, since she'd remember perfectly every stumble and slur of speech that had occurred when she was doped up. Therefore, she decided not to tell them about the bad memories, but those fragmented recollections were starting to wear her down. Her comments about the multiple memories, however, got everyone very excited. When her tests for the day were complete, she would return to her room, look out her window, and think of her dear departed Walter. Nowadays, she spent most of her time alone, crying. Dr. Morrison began the meeting with his staff with a dour announcement. We have another new side effect cropping up now in the Nemeral trials. No one spoke. Bad rumors traveled fast, and nearly everyone had already heard some of the details. 
we're calling the new phenomenon mnemonic feedback. Apparently, in the normal human brain, memories fade over time. Whenever most people remember and retell a story, for instance, they change it a little. They might embellish it, shorten it, or drag it out for a dramatic effect. Each time they do this, the more recent retelling is more vivid than the earlier ones. Over time, most people actually forget the original account and only remember altered versions, which are different from the originals. This is one of the ways that memories are altered, enhanced, and edited over time. What we've discovered is that most of our memories aren't originals. They're imperfect copies, memories of other memories. Memories, it seems, are malleable. As the brain's neural network is repaired by Nemerol, earlier and original versions of memories are emerging, which may sometimes be different than the patient's more recent and familiar ones of a given incident or event. Subjects are then confronted with the inconsistencies across these different versions. Many patients are having difficulty reconciling the different version because they all seem to be equally valid. In the last few months, we've learned a lot about how memory and a lot of our theories have changed. Most of the staff now agrees that we were wrong in thinking that the mind was really designed to be perfect. Memory isn't supposed to be eidetic. Memory is malleable. It's changeable. Memory is dynamic, not static. This ability to alter memory seems to have valid psychological functions. So what's happening to the test subjects? Asked one of the newer members to the project. Some are becoming chronologically confused. They sit for hours sorting through conflicting memories, trying to figure out which ones are true. When this happens, the situation degenerates rapidly. It sets up a feedback loop in which more and more false memories are created. It's analogous to looking at yourself in two mirrors, which face one another. You see a near-infinite series of images, each one shifted a little and slightly different from the others. Basically, our test subjects are getting lost in their own minds. Like children, lost in a house of mirrors at an amusement park. Unfortunately, they can't escape these unwanted images because Nemerol won't let them. We're trying a number of different treatments, but we haven't found anything that's effective yet. Sighing loudly, he said, I've made the decision to stop administering Nemerol to all test subjects who manifest any signs of depression. Reduced dosages have not mitigated these adverse symptoms. We need to halt the progressive expansion of the brain's neural network before it reaches this cascade point. We've obviously gone too far in repairing damaged brain cells and are now creating connections that are harmful to individual psyches. If we terminate the drug early enough, maybe the brain can compensate for the damage we've introduced. He threw down a stack of printouts and said, I need all of you to start working on methods to reverse the effects of Nemerol. That's our highest priority now. Margaret was lost. Not only were the shadow memories, as she called them, getting worse, she'd now remembered all of her dreams, even when she was awake. She could remember every thought that went through her head at night. Sometimes, actually most of the time, they were terrible. While she was strong enough to fight down her bouts of depression during the day, at night, her mind ran rampant through the painful memories she struggled to avoid when she was awake. Now, whenever she woke, she'd recall her dreams and all her most painful memories surfaced once more. She knew that she should have talked to the doctor sooner. Maybe they could have changed her medications before she'd tried to cut her wrists. Her 60-year-old daughter heard about her degenerating condition and had come to visit. But her presence triggered more unwanted memories and left her crying hysterically. Now they had her back on the antidepressants again, but the medications made her so dizzy she couldn't even walk. She was trapped in a wheelchair once more. The new prescriptions numbed her emotionally and diminished her ability to weep, but they also made it hard to think. That, in turn, made it more difficult to suppress the memories she wanted to forget, memories that seemed to focus on every painful event 
that had ever occurred in her life. As she sat staring out the window at the cold rain, the unwanted memories came unbeckoned. She wished she could turn them all off, but she couldn't. If she focused on good memories, she inevitably found something painful to recall about the person or event she tried to distract herself with, and the other memories would rush over her. The antidepressants slowed down the onslaught of the past that haunted her, but they didn't dull the cutting knife of forgotten truths she'd peacefully buried decades before. Margaret stared out the window and tried unsuccessfully to cry. Dr. Eric Morrison sat with his head in his hands when Dr. Blake interrupted him once more. Eric, he said, the board of directors has taken your advice and approved the recall of Nemerol. Morrison looked up, suddenly attentive. Excellent. They should have done that months ago. What finally changed their minds? Two things, Blake replied. First, the new numbers on suicide rates for patients manifesting memory overload, which has now been dubbed enhanced memory dysfunction. Secondly, the rest of the pharmaceutical industry is ready to come down on us with a hammer because the FDA repealed its fast-track policy for clinical tests because of us. They're blaming us for the FDA policy change. By the way, Eric, you wouldn't know how the FDA got the numbers detailing the increase in patients with EMD, would you? The board of directors wanted me to ask you specifically. Eric gritted his teeth and said, The board of directors were ignoring the data. What else could I do? Blake squinted at his friend and said, I didn't think you knew anything about it. Tell you what. I won't tell them that you know if you don't tell them that I know either. Together, they shared a conspiratorial smile. After a moment, Blake asked, Are there any new reports on treatments for the most acute cases? Eric Morrison shook his head. We thought we could manage the side effects of EMD by lowering the doses, but weaker prescriptions merely delay the onset of the depression and hallucinations. Even cutting the medication altogether is ineffective if the patient has reached the saturation level. At that point, the progress of memory collapse appears irreversible. At the lowest dosage levels, it should take about three years for the memory regeneration to process to the point that cascading memories begin. Current estimates are that more than 20% of those who've taken the drug will eventually develop EMD. Unfortunately, there are now nearly 16 million people who've taken Nemerol. My God, said Blake. Please tell me that it's limited to the elderly. Eric Morrison's face grew grim. Sorry, the demographics span the entire population. Soon we'll have teenagers in high school, college students, working adults, and retirees all beginning to suffer the traumas associated with overextended neural nets. It may take a year or two at low dosages to reach that point, but once initial symptoms appear, the collapse of almost all cognitive processes occurs within weeks of reaching the cascade point. Blake looked grim. I have the entire team working on treatments to reverse these effects. Right now we have hundreds of patients who are worse off now than when we found them. They're just as disabled as they were before, but now they're condemned to endless suffering. Blake tried to offer an encouraging smile. The only good news I can offer is that the board's authorized more funds for EMD research. Frankly, they're worried about lawsuits. Several have already been filed, and while lawyers can stall for a couple years, there are bound to be more. Eric grimaced. I know. The press has already started hounding me for interviews. I can't even leave the facility without paparazzi attacking me. I've taken to sleeping in the lab, so I can work on EMD treatment research full time. Blake remained silent. Eric muttered softly. We have to find a treatment. The alternative is unthinkable. 
Dr. Morrison looked out across the wide green lawn of the Far Haven nursing home. Little had changed in the three years since he'd first visited. He approached the head nurse and said, How is she today? Very peaceful, the nurse replied. She's having a good day. And how are the treatments coming along, he asked. Better than we'd hoped. We're following your instructions and only administering doses of lethazine when she starts to cry. Is it true, asked the nurse, that the new drug completely reverses the effects of the old one? Yes, answered the doctor. It helps the patients to forget things. It's the neurotransmitter we originally sought to counter. We found out too late that forgetting is a part of learning and a part of memory as well. The planned obsolescence of the human brain seems to have been built in for a reason. He looked out at the patients and wondered how many of them were suffering from memory loss again. The brain learns to wall off and disable memories that are distressful to it. Over time, slights are forgotten and pain is left behind. Sometimes the brain destroys too many memories. But the nice thing about forgetting is that you're seldom aware of what you've lost. Between the two options, I guess it's better to forget too much than to remember too much. The inability to forget leads to personality instability and schizophrenic disassociation and chronic depression. He sighed deeply and struggled with his words. The gift of memory is a curse, countered only by the blessing of forgetfulness. The only good news that I have to share is that the lethazine treatments seem to be very successful in dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD patients recover quickly when they can more easily forget the incidents that haunt them. The nurse gestured to the nearby patient, resting comfortably in a wheelchair. She's stable now, said the nurse. She's almost like her old self again. Can I talk to her? He asked. Sure, said the nurse. Go ahead. He crouched down beside the wheelchair and said, Hi, Margaret. I'm Dr. Morrison. Do you remember me? The tiny white-haired woman with deep green eyes looked up curiously. N no, I'm sorry, young man. I don't believe so. She squinted at him and examined him more closely. Have we met? No, said Morrison. I'm new here and just thought I'd say hello. She smiled politely. Oh, that's nice. Can I ask what you're doing? he asked. I'm just waiting for my husband, Walter. He's coming to pick me up. We always go for a ride on Sunday afternoons. Eric watched her for a long time without talking and finally addressed her one more time. Are you sure you're all right, Mrs. Winters? She looked up at him and said, Oh, yes, thank you for asking, young man. Then she turned her attention back across the wide lawn and hummed to herself as she searched the distant driveway for any sign of Walter's car. It's a new season, and we have some new authors and new storylines that will absolutely delight you. And as you know, we absolutely love our listeners, fans, and patrons. If you loved what you heard, consider joining us over on Patreon. That's where all the fun happens. Just visit www.patreon.com forward slash Melissa Del Toro voiceover. If you'd like to read more of the stories in the Untold Tales series, not narrated here on our podcast, you can find Jeff's books on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle format. The links for all of this information are conveniently listed in this episode's show notes. Thank you and have a wonderful day.